In this video, I'll talk about acquiring forensic evidence, creating an image. Other terms used for an image are forensic duplicate, forensic copy, or bitstream copy, but they all mean the same thing. The first thing we would need to do when creating a forensic image, at least of a hard drive, is to find out how many hard drives are installed. You know, a few years back, the hard drives were small, so people would add more and more hard drives to give them greater storage capacity, but now that the drives are so large that that's done uh, less frequently, although with RAID systems, which use multiple drives, you will, you will uh, find that. So how do we do that? Well, there's different ways of doing that. One is, you know, open up the, uh, the case of the computer and just look. Or, if you have a dormant that is a non-running machine, you can put a Linux boot forensic CD or a DVD and after you configure the BIOS so that the CD boots before the hard drive is that you can boot up into Linux and then find that information. And the great thing about a Linux CD or DVD is that there you have all the utilities there and you can do a lot of investigative work without ever affecting the system because essentially you're, since you're booting from a CD you're never really touching the hard drive, that is you aren't mounting it. And, and although there is the potential or the capability of mounting a hard drive, but we can do it differently than when, when uh, operating systems mount a hard drive. They mount them in read and write mode because usually we want to read from the contents of the hard drive and we want to change the contents of the hard drive. But by using a Linux boot CD, you can mount a hard drive and access its contents, but you're doing so in a read-only manner which means that you're, you're pretty much guaranteeing that you won't be changing the contents of the file. So let's see how this works right here. So I'm doing this in VMware. And so instead of uh, using a physical DVD or CD, we're going to use a virtual one. And what I've got is, is, is that I've got a copy of um, something called Backtrack, which is a forensics uh, DVD. And so what this is going to do is it, it's going to, this is, a, by the way, a copy of Windows XP Professional. You see up here on the screen. You have to believe me about this. I guess I could have named it anything, but I, I did this for a reason. There you go. It didn't work the first time, so um, <clears throat> that shows you that that actually is Windows XP. So let's shut this down again, and I'm going to boot back into it. It's a le I'm doing this on a Mac, and it's a little easier doing this in um, the VMware version for Windows but there is a way to do it so let me just pause the video and I'll get back with you okay I've made the necessary corrections and let's see if this boots up into the BIOS there we go okay so this is what the BIOS looks like under VMware and notice that I'm scrolling over to the the boot menu and we'll to arrow down to CD-ROM drive and we'll hit plus so now the CD-ROM drive will be the first thing to boot. I'm going to save that configuration. And then we can exit. And notice instead of booting up into Windows, it's booted up into something called Backtrack, which is a forensics-based uh, Linux distribution. And it's booting up. And get the graphical interface here in a second. Here we go. Okay, so uh, even though we're in Windows XP Professional, we're, we are running this forensics uh, Linux distribution in RAM. And so the, the whole reason to show you this was to show you the tools you need to find out the, the configuration of the hard drives in your computer without changing the content. So we can do that with the command called fdisk 
and then dash L for list. And here's our information. Uh, notice that this is disk dev SDA. This dev is just a directory. And SDA uh, stands for three different things, one of which is this says it's, it's a SCSI device. The D means device, and A means there's, it's the first hard drive. So SDA, the A is the first hard drive. If there was an SDB, B would be the second hard drive. And guess what the third one would be? C. It's 8 gigabytes and it tells you something about the the heads and sectors and tracks and cylinders which we'll go more into later on and you notice that the, the boot device down here is dev SDA and now it's got a 1. That 1 means it's the first partition and if you, because there's nothing else on here it means it's the only partition. Sometimes you will see uh, several partitions particularly with uh, Linux computers usually have several but this only has a single partition if you go over here to the right you see that the type of file system and we'll talk about file systems later on in the class is something called NTFS and that's pretty much a standard for the modern uh, Windows operating systems okay and so here here's an example a screen capture of a little more complicated system here we're running fdisk-l again notice this is HDA the H just means it's an IDE drive it's a type of device and, and there's a single hard drive but notice down here is that it has one two three four five six different partitions and interestingly and this is on a, one of my older systems but notice that this says this file system here on this partition is a Windows 95 FAT32 FAT32 is a type of file system and if we look further down here, here's one that's a Linux partition. And another Linux partition and a Linux swap file. And so essentially what I had on this system was a dual boot system with six different partitions and I could boot into either Windows or into Linux. Then finally down here you, you have a, a final partition that's Windows 95 uh, FAT32 formatted. Well, this is interesting. Notice now we have an HDB. So this must mean this must be most likely a second hard drive. Or at least it's a second device. Notice the H is IDE and B means it's the second. And this says that we could boot off this and it's got a single partition on this drive. And it's formatted FAT16. So if we run the Linux command fdisk-l, we can then copy all this information off to a USB drive or a floppy drive, or even better, you can send it over a network connection. That's something I don't get into in, in this introductory class, but in later classes I show you how to do all this over a network. For example, um, I could send this, I could create an image and get all this information anywhere in the world and send it off to another computer. Okay, so you have the tools that you can use that are either Windows based or Linux based. It doesn't really matter. The, the tools, as long as you verify that the tools work, which is important, it means that it doesn't matter. Whatever you're most comfortable with, whatever you have access to, maybe even what is cheapest as long as the tool you're using can be verified to work appropriately. Just remember the number one rule, don't change the evidence. So, if you have a hard drive or you have a computer, if you have the computer, take out the hard drive and you want to be able to see the contents of it. Maybe you just want to get a quick glance to see if there's anything um, relevant that kind of sticks out. How do you do that? Well, remember, if you, if you put the hard drive, let's say, into, let me go down here, into an external connector like this and you plug it in, guess what's going to happen? unless you set up your 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 Linux uh, lab or your forensics workstation correctly that's going to auto mount which means it's going to mount most likely read and write and it's going to change the contents of this and that's not something that you want to do so what do you do instead well there's something called 
a physical write blocker. And essentially, that is a device, and there's some for SCSI drives, IDE drives, USB thumb drives, that allows you to read from a device, a hard drive, or whatever, but will not physically allow the computer to write out to the disk. So it allows reads, but not write access. And essentially, not to get too technical, but it stops any signals from interrupt 13 from being transmitted to the hard drive. Now, what do you do with Linux? Well, there's some of the... Uh, there's some Linux distributions, some of the forensics distributions that don't automatically mount devices connected in read-write mode. However, as I found out recently, the, most of the most popular ones are getting to be just like Windows and, and OS X, and they automatically mount read-write. And so you got to be careful, because I just did a, uh, a test, actually, for this class, trying to, to see what would work and what wouldn't, and every time uh, it would automatically, the uh, Linux that we were using, which is actually Mint, would auto mount a connected device in read and write mode. So what I had to do is we had to write a script that would change uh, some of the configuration files so that even if it did auto mount, it would auto mount in read only mode, which is what we want. So what are some of the information we want from the drives? Well, what type of file system is it? Is it uh, NTFS? FAT16 or FAT32, those are, are uh, Windows-based systems and, and DOS file systems. Is it EXT2? Let me add something. 2, 3, 4, so on. EXT2, 3, and 4 are Linux-based file systems. Riser file system is a Linux-based file system. But you need to note that, and you saw where we get that information. From right here. And if you grab a screen capture, or you just redirect this off to a USB thumb drive, you have this exact same information that you can use to document your evidence drive. You can also list information on the partitions, number of hard drive, and which hard drive boots. Now, let me point out something about the use of um, the debate over using Windows or Linux. There are Windows tools to uh, for forensics that are open source and free that are good but uh, what I found that Linux is more flexible and that's a personal opinion but I've been using it for a while but it uh, you can carry it on a CD or DVD and you can put it on a thumb drive and you can boot into that you just need to be careful now of which Linux distribution you use because again some of these automatically mount the drives and which is going to change the contents uh, more than likely so a, a Linux DVD or a CD that's bootable allows you to connect and duplicate the hard drive without mounting it. And if you want to take a peek on what's on the hard drive is to mount an image read only for logical analysis. So if you look at all the forensics books, and I think I've pretty much seen them all, or at least a lot of them, most forensics books speak of Linux as a required tool or at least a preferred tool for your forensics toolbox. You just need to understand how to use it. So we already talked about, or at least I demonstrated the use of the F disk utility in Linux. It's a this is a menu-driven program, it's but it's not a GUI program, it's a text-based program for creating and manipulating partition tables and also listing that information. So if you want more information about a, d a device, and by device I mean a piece of media that's connected to your uh, computer, run F disk and then the name of the device or if you just run fdisk-l, as we saw previously, previously it lists everything. But just so you understand the nomenclature for the for the devices um, that are listed by fdisk, dev is just a directory and it's a device directory because everything in Linux is is uh, represented as a file, and so a hard drive is a file. That's the way it's represented. So if you see a dev hda, that's an IDE drive. A, it's the first one. HDB is the second IDE hard drive. The S stands for SCSI, SCSI hard drive A. 
And so those will be entire hard drives. Then of course it has to be partitioned and it can have one, it must have at least one if, if not more partitions. So HDA is the first partition on IDE hard drive A, the first hard drive. SDB5 is the fifth partition on the SCSI hard drive B or the second hard drive. You'll always see FD0 as the floppy and the CD-ROM is usually represented as CD-ROM. So that's pretty straightforward. So once again, if you want to use a Linux bootable CD from a dormant machine, you insert the bootable CD, and there's, there's different ones, Nopix or Fire or Backtrack. Let me put that in here. Backtrack. There's quite a few of them. Or just, actually, you don't, you don't even need a forensic CD. Uh, they do include the additional tools that, that are useful for some forensics analysis, but just usually any old Linux CD will work. As the machine boots up, you need to ensure the order of the boot, as I showed you in the BIOS, and you need to catch that quickly before the hard drive boots. And uh, sometimes it's good to have a cheat sheet to know um, which uh, keys are used to boot into the BIOS. Sometimes it's F2, other times it's F12, and you need to get that quickly. And then if you get that correctly, and then you save those changes, then your, it says Nopix, which is one of the earlier Linux distributions that was bootable off a of CD. Uh, it will boot up, and then you can open up a terminal window, which you saw previously. It's just, you know, a command line terminal, and then run this command right here to run fdisk. And here's another example of that. Notice single hard drive here. It's an ID hard drive, 48 gigabytes. Uh, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six partitions. And once again, this looks like over here, if you look at the file systems on here, this appears to be a dual bootable system with Windows and Linux. Notice the first partition is NTFS, which would be Windows, and the second and third are Linux. And you notice down here on four, you can only have four primary partitions. And that's it. But if you create something called an extended partition, which is kind of like a container, then within that you can create something called, you can create more partitions within the extended partition. And so that's why you see this extended partition here, which is just a container, and then everything else under here will be contained within this partition. And so when are we going to get to the uh, forensic image duplication process? Well, here we go. So there's, there's many ways to create a forensic image. And this is called a bit level or, or bit stream copy, which means that from the very first bit or byte on the drive all the way to the last one, everything will be copied. And it comes out as a single file, almost like a, if you think of a CD drive, if you want to make a, or a CD, if you want to make a copy of that, you're going to make a copy of the entire thing. And so there are lots of different applications that do that. Some of these the commercial applications, most of these are still around. This in case is, uh, is, uh, is a forensic suite. Let me add one more to here. In case an FDK or forensic suites, and then you have Linux, and Linux has a real small utility that works wonderfully, and it's called DD for disk dump or data dump. Note that up here that, that these programs often create proprietary formatted uh, or pro uh, a copy that's of a proprietary format. Although you can you can you can read the files that you can't read them across different applications. So if you create something in, for example, Semantic Ghost, it's not going to be readable in any of the other utilities here. But in case and FTK do provide you the capability of creating something called a DD image, and DD is just an exact physical image, and so it's really it's really great to work with DD because you always know that if you create a DD with Linux. You can use it in these other applications, in case and FTK. Okay, to make things a little quicker, what I've done is, is I've inserted a 64 megabyte 
USB flash drive into my computer. And instead of uh, making a forensic duplicate of a hard drive, which could take quite a while, what we're going to do is just make a forensic duplicate of the flash drive. So again, I, I ran fdisk-l. Notice SDA up here would be what SCSI device, first hard drive, 8 gigabytes. Notice that it has three partitions. It is a Linux partition. Notice that SDA2 is that extended partition I talked about. So there's really only two partitions. There's the extended partition, which has the Linux swap file inside that. And then we have the regular Linux partition. And then our second disk, we have SDB SCSI device B, which is the 64 megabyte flash drive. Notice down here, it's got a single partition and it's been formatted with a FAT16 file system. Now recall I talked about the file systems automatically mounting and unmounting drives. Well, to, the way to find out, and let me explain mounting. Mounting simply means that a, a device has been connected and there needs to be a way for the operating system and the file system to work with each other. That is the operating system to be able to read the files off the file system. And the way it does this is by mounting it. And so if you type mount, this tells you everything that is mounted currently on the hard drive. And it's, it gets quite complicated down here, but if you look up at the top, notice that it says dev SDA1, first partition on the first hard drive, is mounted on this forward slash, which just means the root drive the type of file system and notice that it has RW there. That means read write because we need to be able to read from it and we also need to write to it. And you can kind of disregard everything else underneath there. So what we want to do is we want to make a forensic copy of that first partition. How do we do that? How do we make a forensic copy of the first partition? Well I said we're going to do that with DD and here's how we do it. Let me type all this out. And we'll see how this works. So DD is the program. In fact, we need to, we need to run this as, as the administrative account. And the way we do this under Linux is to type sudo. And I accidentally hit enter. So and see if it's working. It's working right now. So I'm running this as root. DD is the program. The IF means read from this. And what am I reading from? I'm reading from dev sdb1 and then I'm writing it out. Output file equals copy.dd. So this is going to make a copy of that of this uh, USB flash drive. And it's going to be output to a file called copy.dd. And it took a little while, so I paused the video. But you see here that it read in this many records. And a record is a chunk of data that it reads. And it just so happens that the default is 512 bytes, which is really small. There are other options I could have used up here to make this go a lot faster. But it copied 64 megabytes in about 60 seconds at 1 megabyte a second. So let's see, we call this copy.dd. Here we go. And you see there's the size of the file. And we have our forensic copy. Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because I, I have another uh, lecture on something called hashing. And <clears throat> hashing simply means we need a way to verify that that copy right there was a good copy. That is, is it a perfect copy of our physical device? Because if it's not, that means something is wrong. And so we need to, to have a, um, a verified and mathematical way 
of determining whether it's a good copy, and we do that through a hash. And so I'm going to run through a simple illustration here, then you'll get the full treatment on hashes in a later video. But there's a hash called the MD5 hash. And so what this is going to do is, is that no matter what length, how, how large the file is that's going to be input into this program, it's going to, to, uh, it's going to output a fixed length string, in this case 128 bits, that is mathematically related to the contents of the file. And this is, although this is a copy of a, of a partition on a device, it's still just a file. And so, if we run this, there is the unique hash associated with the contents of this forensic image. Now ask yourself something. Now that we have that, we're going to store that away somewhere. And so, if we need to share this, this copy.dd with somebody, we can send that to them on a CD or over a network. And the way to verify that it hasn't changed in transit is to also send them this hash. If they run the same command on their workstation and the hash is different, that means that file has changed. I can't tell you how it's changed, it just means it's changed. But that's all explained in the hashing video. One last thing we need to do is that we need to determine whether this is a good copy. I mean, we think it is. There's the hash, but does it match this? Remember, this is the actual physical device right here. This is the electronic copy. Do you think we can run this MD5 hash on this? Let's try it. MD5 sum. MD5 sum is just the name of the program. The actual name of the hash is MD5. Dev SDB1. Let's run that. Oh. Good. We can't do that without running it with administrator privileges. Recall, there are some commands that you need to be running as administrator, and it's called root under Linux to run that. So let's run that command. And I, my thumb drive is working away. And there we go. Notice that the two numbers, and there we go. Notice that the two numbers are exactly the same, which means that we made a perfect copy of this physical device. Okay, so just show you, so you are aware that there are many other options with the DD command. I'm not going to get too far into this. Uh, it's, it's a good idea to, to go over this in a lab. <clears throat> But here it's kind of boring. But you see that, that this is an example here of one of the commands. And notice that there are several options. So actually, there's only one option right here. Um, IF, again, is the input file, which in this case is a device. The output file here is suspect.dd. And remember I said the, the block size was 512 bytes. You can set it to larger, which means now if BS equals 1 megabyte, that's what the 1M means, is that it will, it will read and write in chunks of 1 megabyte, which will mean it will work a lot faster. Okay, there's also a DD for Windows, and I talked about this in the hashing video. Um, and so if you'd like to run DD under Windows, you can go to the site that I'll post up on the screen right here sh shortly. But this shows you that whatever you can do with respect to DD and Linux, you can also do in Windows. It just requires an extra step of um, writing it down, of downloading the software and installing it, which is really easy. And this just shows you the different syntaxes you would use based upon the operating system, whether it's Linux or Unix, and whether it's Windows right here. And here's some of the references again. These are not the full list of references, but um, it's a partial list uh, that was used to, to create the documents here. What's really great for uh, if you want to learn Windows are the man pages. 
that come with Linux are just the manual pages that you can access from the command line for all the different utilities that we use in this course. And again, uh, the best way to, to learn this is actually by doing it. Get yourself a thumb drive, open up your VMware and a Linux virtual machine, and create some copies or just work with uh, creating copies of files and copying things off of a, of a small device, as small as you can get, because it does take quite a bit of time to create these copies.